playing some World War II music here in the background. Hopefully it doesn't make my voice sound too dull. Listen, here's what I want from you. Take your document sheet, your document sheet that looks something like this, except maybe not with Mo's handwriting. Just kidding, Mo. I can usually read most of what you write. Anyway, just kidding. Um, take it out for me, please. And then let's go over these together. What is document one saying? The V for victory sign is displayed prominently in all the so-called democratic countries, which are fighting for victory over aggression, slavery, and tyranny. So-called. This writer is saying the United States, for example, is trying to fight for freedom for the Germans to liberate oppressed peoples in Germany, but there are people here that don't have freedom, African-Americans especially. So so-called democratic countries like the United States, we say that we are about equality, but you know, all men created equal and women, but are all men and women treated equally? No, so let the colored Americans adopt the double V for a double victory. So what is James G. Thompson proposing? If you put something like this, then you're good. You should have something like he wants freedom for Germany, but also freedom for black Americans at a whole. You got, you got to have something like that, okay? Uh, if you've got something that's close to that, then you're good. What was life like for um, African Americans, for black Americans during World War II? Just remember that there was segregation. So if you don't, if you have something like Jim Crow laws or segregation or something like that, those are the words that you need to be using. If you put down racism, I guess that's okay, but separated in society, not allowed to be in the same restroom, same public school, etc., as white people. What do you already know about the treatment of black Americans and the role FDR and A. Philip Randolph um, to create change for blacks during World War II? A. Philip Randolph threatened for a march on Washington unless FDR integrated, desegregated the defense industries. That means if you were working in a shipyard building ships, you shouldn't have to have a white section and a black section. There should be, right? And the pay should be equal. So FDR did not want, during the middle of the war, a march on Washington, D.C. with tens of thousands of white and black civil rights leaders. And so what he did was Randolph got FDR to desegregate the defense industries. If you have something like that, then you're fine. You don't have to change it. If you don't, please change it for me now. Pretty please with sugar on it. Pretty please with sugar. With sugar on it. Okay, so how about this next thing, document two. Um, how did life change for Sarah Killingsworth during the war? From what I gather from this, she is saying that society became more integrated, which means society became less segregated, that society became more desegregated. From what I can tell, I mean, um, 
when she said the uh, very first it was segregated when she came here. When I came here, it was awful. They didn't mix black and white in the war, but now it gives you a kind of independence because they went off and fought and now realize that everybody should be equal. We got chances to go places they'd never been to before. So society became more open for African-Americans. If you've got something like that, then great. That's all you need for this. How did it change for her brother? And let me make sure that that's spelled correctly. Integrated. Yep. Okay. How did it change for her brother? It says in here, when he was in the military, he learned new skills new job skills if you got something like that then you're good if not then then try to change it yeah because when they came back they took trades learned to do things brother came back now he's very successful he works at the rockwell in the missile department he's a supervisor So I want you to know that life wasn't always, was not great either for, for Hispanic Americans. You might remember that during the 20s, uh, Hispanic Americans had been allowed in from Mexico. Uh, Hispanic people had been allowed in from Mexico to work um, because there are plenty of jobs. But then when the Great Depression hit, Herbert Hoover kicked them out. Um, during the 1940s, when we were in the war, um, there was what was called the Bracero program where FDR allowed Hispanic Americans to, to work again and, and more, more immigration as well, um, especially in farms and fields and so on and so forth. Um, but it wasn't always great if you notice here zoot suit riots if you don't know what a zoot suit is very baggy outfits that were worn by a lot of people but you know also some hispanic Amer americans as well um, and the reason why it was such a controversy was this was the era of conservation of materials we're trying to conserve and so um, having big baggy clothing wasn't what was like seen as unpatriotic. And so um, there were riots against Mexican Americans wearing zoot suits. And you can see here in this right here, the, uh, it basically talks here about there were some uh, Hispanic Americans working in the defense plants and some Hispanic Americans working in uh, in the military under General MacArthur, right? But if you read through the rest of what they're saying here, they're saying that they were mistreated by police a lot. You know, they weren't allowed to go to movie theaters or swimming pools. And you can see they would say all we wanted to do was go into a dancer go swimming and just stand around or just stand around and not be bothered by anybody, but they were treated like criminals. So um, life was not always good for several different minorities in our country, even during World War II. A lot of you probably know this already and you don't need me to go over it with you. So just check to see what you've got here. But if you don't know how rationing works is that you only use a little bit of something. You don't use everything that you possibly can. You save a little so that it'll go a long way. So how did rationing work during World War II? Government only allowed you to buy certain amount of certain materials. Do you remember some of the materials that had to be rationed? You're, you're right. Gasoline, milk, eggs, meat, shoes. 
etc. Right. By the way, if you want to do a World War II ration cake, if you would like the recipe for a World War II ration cake, uh, I mean, you just look at all this. Um, the chocolate part, I think, kind of cheats a little bit because uh, if you actually try one of these actual ration cakes, you'll see that it's not supposed to taste amazing. It's supposed to remind you that people were sacrificing during the war. If you want to make a World War II ration cake and you're interested in doing that, uh, I have to get approval. I can't just have anybody come and you know, bring in a ration cake, especially because who knows what kind of weird things you might put in it, some of you. Okay. And it's not coming up, but you can look, I mean, and you'll see like, like you make these ration cakes without like eggs, milk, or butter, or something like that. Right. Ugh. Okay. So going back to the question, how does rationing demonstrate a change in the role of government? I mean, this is government getting more powerful. I mean, that's a lot of power that the government has to say that you can't buy a certain thing or you can only buy a certain amount of, of this thing. Uh, food even. I mean, that's... And you can say, no, Mr. Beavers, we needed it because the war was a big deal and we've got to win the war. And I'm not saying that, that you're wrong. I'm just saying that the federal government had... A lot more power than they did even during World War One. So, yay or nay. If you didn't like the COVID restrictions, then you probably won't like rationing. And, you know, Japanese Americans, what happened to them? This is Ansel Adams. And Ansel Adams was, uh, was a photographer. And he was is very well known for his taking photographs of the West. Um, I mean, some of these pictures of, of Yosemite National Park are just, they're just amazing, uh, breathtaking. Uh, yeah, you can see a picture of him there. Um, but some of the, the places that he took pictures, I mean, it's just gorgeous. If you've never been to Yosemite National Park, you got to go. It's out in California. I mean, why not go to California, right? I mean, some of these are, are just amazing. And, and of course, this website's trying to sell you his prints, I guess. But the, the point is, he's also making a social statement here. And he's telling us about how Native Americans were, or uh, Japanese Americans were treated during the war. And this is, this is horrible. They, they were put in concentration camps, right? Concentration. Concentration camps, and of course, I didn't spell it right. Concentration, maybe I did spell it right. And not death camps. That's the kind of death. That's the kind of camp that Hitler had, right? Where they put people in gas chambers and stuff like that. But, not, but concentration just means we're putting people in a concentrated area a lot of people in a smaller area. And that's what happened. These internment camps is what we called it because internment camp sounds a lot better than concentration camp. And yes, the Japanese people that were put in these internment camps during the war were given three square meals a day, education, you know, a relatively clean environment, but still they were prisoners in the middle of nowhere. Um, I mean, for heaven's sake, right? Man, Zanar camp these are their civil rights to strip from them right yeah here they're playing sports okay sure right but but look they're taken from their homes their homes are sold or, or whatever right they're made to go out into the middle of nowhere. And you, you might say, well, Mr. Beavers, they get to play basketball. Well, yeah, look, but, but they're, they're in a prison camp, essentially. And look back, even if they wanted to, to escape, look at this. I mean, where are they going to go? It's in the, middle, in the middle of the mountains. Right? And sometimes they would get you know, weekend passes to go out to maybe a small town nearby. But you know why they, this happened to them? All because of fear of 
sympathy for Japan. Or that there might be spies. I would put that down. Fear of spies. So, yikes. What did Ansel Adams think of this? I mean, if you're reading this and you're thinking that he thinks it's a good idea, um, then you missed the whole point of it. His tone is critical of internment. So that's that. Uh, Rosie the Riveter, who is the audience for this poster? The audience that hopefully you put something down about women wanting work outside the home. This is Rosie the Riveter, the nickname for the women who would go to in the factories and they would rivet the bolts in place on the big ships, right? The purpose of this poster was recruiting. They wanted to recruit women to the factories and it was showing them as strong and capable and, and doing their patriotic duty too. Um, What's this tell you about the shift in the average American household, uh, at least during wartime, at least during wartime. Now, after the war is over, the women will have to go back to their jobs because the men are coming home. Right. Or the women will go to secretarial labor again. But at least during wartime. Needs override traditional domestic work for women and instead they get these big rivets and just go and get the get the bolt uh get the boats ready for the the sailors to to go across the seas in now 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 this is what this is the executive order that a philip randolph got FDR to sign when A. Philip Randolph threatened his march on Washington. So this is coming full circle back around to those first couple documents that you had. Um, the segregation of the defense industries. I wish that he had done it. FDR desegregated this before the threat of march on Washington. A. Philip Randolph shouldn't have had to do this. It should have just been on FDR's mind, but, you know, that's, you know, right. Um, so um, what does this tell us about the perception of racial minorities during wartime? Um, <clears throat> well, They're necessary contributors to the war effort, to the war's effort. They're they're needed. We can't do without them because if we could do without them, then FDR would have never signed this. But we have to have everybody, and that includes, you know, uh, racial minorities, especially African Americans here. So, I want you to make sure that all of your notes that you wrote down said that. Okay, take time just to make sure if you have to push pause then push pause make sure that all of your answers kind of align to that if you have a question about something bring it up to me now will you please take the other sheet of paper the uh -oh, uh -oh. nope uh, rosie the riveter take the other sheet of paper that you have that looks like this and here's the answers one should be there do you, is your one there two there ish three there ish four five c goes there six goes there seven is the movie casablanca telling you about sacrifice for the war if you've never seen casablanca you should this is it's an american classic Here's looking at you, kid. Eight, nine, ten there, eleven there, twelve there in the window, thirteen victory gardens, 
14, 15, Rosie the Riveter. And then 5A is that stop sign. 5B is that sign that basically says you get five or three gallons a week of gas for your gas ration. Make sure that you have that down. Now, final instructions. Final instructions. And I'm going to turn off the music so that I can make sure that you are paying attention. Final instructions here. What you need to do now is take your papers, the worksheet, and the the picture. Make sure that everything is correct and then go hand it to Mr. Beavers. And those two worksheets and this Ed Puzzle will be your final grades for this nine weeks. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. Don't do anything stupid. You got that, Craig? Yeah, that's right, Craig.